Hey everybody, we are in our series called OTMA, Old Testament uh, Mature Themes, where we're looking at some of the stories of the Old Testament as they're written. None of the softened up Sunday school version here. We're going into all the gory details in this series. Today I want to look at a story from the book of Judges. Now, this is around the 12th century BC, before the kings of Israel and after the exodus of God's people from Egypt where they entered the promised land. And the Israelites, who have seen multiple miracles and watched as God supernaturally delivered on his promises, have begun to reject him again. I mean, you see this happen throughout the history of Israel. Uh, they abandon listening to God. They stop worshiping God. And as the one true God, um, they, they just ignore him altogether. They start adopting pagan principles. They, they, they step out of the blessing of God. Now, I don't want to get too off the subject here, but I, I do want to make a point here before we dig in. When God stops blessing his people because of their disobedience, or when he corrects them because of their disobedience, it's not because he's some cosmic killjoy and doesn't want anyone to have any fun. No, this is not about, about what, what's fun. It's about what is truly best for his people, collectively and individually. I mean, we have to remember that sin has consequences individually and generationally. We need to understand the, 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 the culture of what it is that's going on in the 12th century. I mean, these are mostly nomadic, mostly barbaric, no moral underpinnings. This was a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Think of the, the world of Mad Max and Thunderdome without, without machines. Utter mayhem. But, but God steps in and he makes a deal with one nation, the Israelites, to lead them and guide them and teach them. So he gives them laws. That'll help them become a great and healthy nation. Help them become a starting point that will eventually adapt and evolve to a place where the teachings of Jesus could be given and received, if only by a few, that would see birthed the justice and morality and forgiveness that we have seen some of in our society today. And that's why God put such a, a high priority on justice for the Israelites. He, he wanted his people to live in a society where, where justice reigned, where freedom reigned, where, where there was no oppression, where the, the poor and helpless and the widows and the orphans were taken care of, not just cast aside. That's why he also gave them some of the, the dietary requirements of the Old Testament, which were mainly for health reasons. I mean, he told his people not to eat pork. Why? Well, because in those days... Pigs were major carriers of trichinosis, and he didn't want his people eaten up by worms. Practical. He gave specific directions on how to dispose of human waste, to take it outside the living area and bury it in the ground. Why did he say that? Because most people didn't do that. Other cultures didn't have this habit. They, they let it run in the streets. Things were crappy back then, literally. As a result, most of the ancient cult cultures were disease-ridden. So God's plan to prosper one nation was another reason why he told them not to, not to do this and, and not to marry people outside of other cultures and thereby get sick. When you actually study the ancient cultures and get a glimpse of, of how they conducted society, what their idea of morality was, what their idea of justice was, what their idea of faith was, man, you see, you see why it was necessary for the people of Israel to be a people set apart who don't live as the rest of the world lived. Throughout history, you, you see something like a, like a roller coaster ride with the nation of Israel. They're at, the, they're at the top of the ride, and then they rebel against God, and he withdraws his blessing, and they suffer the consequences with a free fall to the bottom. Then they come to their senses. They return to God. They ascend once again to a life of blessing, and then they repeat their cycle again, up and down, up and down. They rebel. They fall. They repent. They return. The sad truth is that, I mean, I've seen this pattern in my own life and in the lives of many people that I know. Some people leap into outright rebellion, but most people just kind of lapse into a, a cold kind of mediocrity. It's a respectable, respectable type of rebellion where everything still looks good on the surface, but the heart is like a block of ice. When you're in this condition, you, you, know, you know that things aren't exactly right. You, you know that the blessing of God doesn't reign in your life like it once did. You begin to lose battles that you, you should never really lose. And, and your victories become few and far between. And you remain just religious enough during the process to say, God, what in the world is wrong with you? Or, God, what's wrong with Christianity? Or, God, am I not one of your children? 
Why, why aren't things in my life better than this? And Einstein's quote comes into play where he said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. In the book of Judges, the Jews live this quote out too, and they're in trouble again. You'd think they'd learn. <laughs> It was an instead an example of, of, I think, mass insanity. The cycle never seemed to end, and they were in the middle of it again. In, in chapter 1, that they failed to drive out the inhabitants from the land, disobeying God. Uh, they forgot about God. They instead served Baal, and, and they followed and worshipped various gods of, of, of the people around them. It was ugly again. I mean, they prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. So the Lord let them be again. And without his protection, their enemies moved in, just as he said they would. The Canaanites and others would, would sweep in, raid them, beat them, abuse them, take their children, kill them. Then, only then, would they cry out to God. So God, he, back then, he would raise up judges who, who saved them out of the hands of the raiders. And, and they obeyed God. The people of Israel obeyed God as long as the judges lived. But once, once the judges died, the people went back to their rebellion and turned from God. They, they, they refused to give up their evil practices and their stubborn ways. So God became a little frustrated and angry at their stubborn ways. And he said, because this nation has not kept the co covenant that I laid down for their fathers and has not listened to me, I'll no longer drive out from them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died. Instead, I'll use them to test Israel to see if they will keep the way of the Lord. Which brings us today to Judges 4, which is our story. The Lord gave the Israelites into the hands of the Canaanites. And the king of the Canaanites was Jabin. The general of the Canaanites was Sisera. And this army had 900 iron chariots. And they cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord. I think sometimes all we can do is cry out to the Lord. Uh, Psalm 40 says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. That's so important for us to remember. Sometimes we just need to cry out to the Lord. And he'll pick us up. And he'll, he'll put us back into favor with him. Anyways, these guys, because they cried out to God, God sent a judge to them that was just a little different from the others. This judge was a woman. A woman? Can you imagine that? A woman? A woman? Now, what goes through your mind when I say it like that? A woman. I mean... Today, in our culture, that doesn't sound that far off. I mean, we believe that a woman can do anything, that she has equal rights with the men. And, and though that does not always get carried out perfectly in our society, in, in reality, unfortunately, we're still a far cry from ancient Israel where women were more or less viewed as property. They were owned by men. This was a world of men run by men. So it's a bit unusual to have a woman hold such a, an important post. And also Deborah was not only judge, but she was also a prophet. Uh, she was one of the only two judge prophets that ever lived. And so the Israelites would come to her to get disputes settled, and God partnered with her in a big way because she was willing. And this is my first point today. Willing people will be activated for God's work. Willing people, God will use anybody who's willing to be used by him. Look at, look at some of the people that got activated in the Bible. Prostitutes, shepherds, tax collectors, fishermen, people who seemingly had nothing to offer in the way of greatness. God used to accomplish mighty things, but they all had one thing in common. They were willing. Not always enthusiastic, not always happy about the mission, but willing to go and do. And Deborah had a message for Barak, the leader of Israel's army. He, he, was, he was to go down and destroy Sisera and his army and, and the army that had been oppressing all of the Israelites. And now to Barak, this was not good news. Didn't Deborah know that Sisera had 900 iron chariots at his disposal? Iron chariots. I mean, what could he do against that? Was this a setup? Had he done something to displease God? Surely he must be joking, or at least Deborah was. <laughs> so Barak comes up with a little test. Uh, he'll go if Deborah will fight with him too. That would test the waters to see if this was a joke or something. So, so surely she wouldn't go. War was a man's game, not, not a place for women, even if she was a, a powerful prophetess, whatever. And much to his surprise, she said, yeah, I'll go. But with the understanding that then 
Barak would not receive the credit, but that a woman would get the credit. Verse 7. Barak thought, why not? I mean, everybody knows that Deborah is a prophetess, and, and she has a hotline to God already, so what's the big deal when the dust settles and, and all of this thing is over? Everybody will know that it was Barak that actually pulled this thing off, not her. I mean, what was she going to do? Single-handedly uh, take out Sisera and all of his chariots? Wave her hand and the, the wheels would just kind of fall off the chariots? Not likely. A woman, indeed. I mean, they'll know it was me. Notice that Barak doesn't deny that, that he's supposed to go. He doesn't deny that the message is from God. He only says that without Deborah, he won't go. Why is this? I think maybe he felt like since she was the messenger, she should go too. Or maybe he needed confirmation that this message was actually from God. Or maybe he didn't trust God. Or maybe he was afraid to go alone. Is it all right to be afraid? John Wayne said that, that courage was being scared to death and mounting up anyways. Anyways, Barak agrees to go. He's willing. So they both went down together to Gadesh where where they summoned 10,000 men from Natali and Zebulon, a few tribes. Barak had believed Deborah, but never dreamed that the, the victory would be so swift or so complete. I mean, after seeing Sisera's chariots coming in the distance, coming across the valley floor, his heart had probably melted to butter. I mean, what did he gotten himself into? He and his army were no match for those chariots, and they all knew it. But what was that weird sound? And he, and he looks around, and the mountains are suddenly behind him disappearing as torrents of rain come sweeping down the slopes and as the rain roars past he watches as the valley below begins to turn to mud and the heavy iron chariots roll into it and gradually slow down and then stop completely and the horses are unable to pull anymore and and none of these guys are going anywhere and and this was the opportunity that they had hoped for but never believed that would possibly happen now it was his chance Brock it may not have 900 chariots, but he had 10,000 men who were hungry for victory. So with a, a mighty shout, they come charging down the hill toward the Sisera and his helpless men who were leaping from their chariots and running in every direction. And his army, his army gave chase with Barak himself in hot pursuit of Sisera. I mean, he wanted this guy, a woman. Pfft, no, if he captures Sisera, he'll be the champion of the day. No one else, not Deborah. I think it's important to remember that in the things of God, it doesn't matter who gets the credit as long as God gets the glory. I mean, God will share the credit with you, but he will not share his glory. Now, Barak had to admit that Sisera, this guy could run. It, it goes to show you that the speed of a man's legs are determined more by who's doing the chasing. <laughs> Mike Eady uh, gave me this picture uh, that is uh, a class of his, wrote and illustrated a book about dinosaurs. And I think this picture is fitting. Uh, the next page, I I'm sure it, Frank uh, passes all of them. Anyways, back to our story. Through all of the rain and mud and confusion, Sisera gets a head start. But Barak knew which way he had gone. He'd ordered some men to come follow him, and, and off they went. After an hour or so of chasing, they came upon the compound of, of Heber the Kenite. Could he be there? Uh, not likely. I mean, everybody know that the, the, the Kenites are, are, are cozy with King Jabin. And, and this would be probably the first place they'd look for Sisera, so he probably wouldn't have stayed there long. Uh, Barak figured he'd maybe stop for a drink, stop for a brief break and maybe some goat barbecue and then be gone. But Jael, the wife of Heber, comes out of the tent and says, the man that you're looking for is in my tent. Now, Barak probably reaches for his sword, alarmed. She's talking so loudly, let's run away. Sisera will certainly, certainly hear her. Jael sees the look on Barak's face and laughs and says, don't worry, he won't be going anywhere. With a toss of her head, she motions for Barak to, to follow her into the tent. There she uncovers Sisera, eyes bulging out of his head, not moving or breathing, flies likely buzzing about at this time, and a tent peg sticking out the side of his head, the other end embedded into the ground. See, Sisera had arrived expecting shelter from his enemies with his allies. But Jael, after covering him up and making sure he was asleep, had swiftly and silently driven the tent peg through his temple. He never even knew what hit him. 
Now, likely JL had had enough of his pan of, of pandering to this oppressive abuser. Being being nomadic, JL had been driving tent pegs since she was a child. One strong arm, one heavy hammer, one sharp tent peg, and one hard blow equaled one great victory. And it was that easy. Now, Barack is probably dumbfounded. All that chasing and running and sweating, and here's Cicero lying there dead. Dead as a, well, tent peg. Killed by a, a woman? I mean... All of the troops of, of, of Sisera died. All of them. The entire army. And that sounds harsh, but we need to remember, doing things with God brings total victory. Now, we may never see it, or we might not see it and actually recognize it, but the Bible tells us that the victory is ours when the battle is the Lord's. God never wins halfway. Uh, Jesus never performed half a miracle. God's armies never won half a victory, half a promise. No. When God does something, He does it completely. And you need to remember that. Now, I'm not sure whether it was here or later that it occurred to Barack that Deborah's prediction about a woman getting the credit came true. All along, he thought it was Deborah herself that, that, that she had meant that she would get the credit, but instead it was J.L., the nomadic wife of Heber the Kenite, a lowly tent dweller. I think this story begs the question, what does it take to do something big for God? Willing people will be activated for the king's work. What is required to be a servant of God in his church? Simply to understand these three things. God will use anyone who is willing to be used by him. And it doesn't matter who gets the credit as long as God gets the glory. And doing things with God will bring a total victory. Only by submitting to God can, can we do a good work for him. And even when the outcome may surprise us, it will in fact surprise us. The surprise is that God can do anything that he wants. That, that he, the fact that he chooses people like Deborah, like Barak, like JL, people like us to do his work is amazing. God is looking for some people who want to do something big for him. And you have to ask yourselves, are you willing to be willing? Are you willing to partner with God in what he wants to do in our time now? Are you willing to be sent into wherever it is that God currently has you and for you to be online and willing to step in, to do something for him, to be obedient to what it is that he's asking you to do, to, to have faith and raise up and speak truth and speak the gospel to people around you? Are you willing? Because if you're willing, God will use you in a great and powerful way. But let's start with, are you willing? Let's pray. Father God, will you forgive us for sometimes getting so distracted and busy in our everyday lives that we forget that we're supposed to check in with you, that we forget that we're supposed to stop and pray and be willing and ask you to move in our lives. Lord God, we know that uh, when we're willing that you will do a great work. You will bring a complete victory. And God, we will give you all of the glory. So Father, we're, we're stopping today to pause. To give thank you for this story. I'm sure it's gruesome. <laughs> but Father, we know that you want to do something powerful through us. And so we're asking, God, will you come into our life? Will you come into our life in a powerful way? And will you use us for something amazing? A, a, an amazing act of love, an amazing act of morality where, where maybe uh, um, uh, orphans and widows might find hope. The people around us who are lost and struggling might find hope. God, will you help use us to make a difference and bring a complete victory to somebody else's life? Father, we're saying we're willing. Use us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much. Hope you're enjoying this series. Now go and do something. Go and be willing to do something for God. Bring a complete victory and give God the glory. Have a fantastic week. Be blessed.